The following show contains adult content. It's not our intent to offend anyone, but we want to inform you that if you are a child under the age of 18 or get offended easily, this next show may not be for you. The content, opinions, and subject matter of these shows are solely the choice of your show hosts and their guests, and not those of the Entertainment Network or any affiliated stations. Any comments or inquiries should be directed to those show hosts. Thank you for listening. Hey, ho, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Jimmy Star Show with Ron Russell, bringing you the good times in music, fashion, pop culture, and entertainment. It's going to be a fun, fun show today. I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, we have uh, one of my favorite icons of horror, Brett Wagner's coming on. And after Brett Wagner comes on, we're going to have uh, our favorite violinist, Daisy Jockling. Oh, coming on. I have to find out what happened after each of so it sh went. should be a lot of fun yeah. um, today, you guys. I'm looking forward to it. I also want to do some shout outs. Um, uh, two big shout outs. Uh, First off, we want to wish Cindy Di Diadamo, Diadamo, I'm not even sure how it is, Cindy Lady Lake, because that's how I know her. Uh, today is her birthday, and she's a very good friend of mine for about 15 years, so I want to happy wish her a happy birthday, birthday. Gemini. And I also want to um, give a happy birthday to Twiz and White Piece, who did our ex uh, exit song, and today is his 41st happy birthday. Happy birthday, Gemini. There you go. And we want to give a shout out. People are starting to show up in the chat room. Mike Wagner from the Mike Wagner Show. Hey, Mike, how you doing? Cindy Lady Lake is in the chat room. B. Claudia from Germany. Hey, B, how are you? Um, so I just want to make sure we wish everybody a happy birthday. We hope you guys have a great birthday and a great day every day. Obviously, we want everything to always be good. Um, so then uh, we've got all the dogs. What else is going on now with us? Well, aside from the fact that I'm in severe pain all <laughs> over my body because I'm married to a man who thinks I'm 34 years old <laughs> or true. 24 years old. And I do things with him at almost 84 years old that 60-year-olds can't do. I lifted boulders this big, okay? I've dug holes. I dug a trench. I planted flowers. I, uh, I did a water system with pipes. In yesterday, 99 degrees it was. 99, and the sun was beating down. I swear to you, I felt like I was a slave out in the cotton fields, and Jimmy was the master. I wasn't whipping, the master. Me. I told you to tell me what to do, and you're like, I'm no, 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 no. I gotta now, do it. Now, now, I was out this morning completing the garden. I didn't help today. Pad, I didn't and I worked my ass off, and then I had to come in, take a shower, and get dressed and do this show for free. I don't get paid. He thinks because we're married, I don't need to get a salary. Well, you bring in an advertiser, and then you can get a salary. You know what I have? Two words for you. It's <laughs> yeah. not happy holiday. Yeah. All right. Bring in. Bring in. Mm -hmm. Bring in. Okay. That's how it all works. Um, no, when I work in a movie, I get paid. They don't say bring in. I know, but this isn't a movie. This is a, a show with your name in it, the title. Big deal. Well. What does that get me? What, my name gets me money since when? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Anyway, you guys, we missed so, last week. So I'm married to someone who really doesn't care about me or love me. Yeah, He's just right. married to me so he can make me a slave of his yes. and do all the jobs that he's too lazy to do because he's... Oh, please don't say lazy. I mean, come on, be real. I, I like to get you mad. I know, but <laughs> he worked, I work 15 he hours a day. Little, yeah, <sighs> but he's, you know, he's 23 years my junior. That's true. So... You know, he doesn't... Uh, no, you can see. I was in the sun. See how splotchy I am? I was out there, too. That's why my face looks like I got attacked by ants. 
And yours is beautiful and perfect. Of course, because I have Italian skin with, yeah. all, with olive oil in it. Lots of olive oil on it and in it. Olive oil is the answer to no wrinkles and a healthy complexion. So all is good. Um, we missed last week, but we're happy to be back. And we're probably going to have yes, a few weeks coming up. Last week, I had a Euro lift. Not a facelift, a Euro lift. Because at my age, all of you men and women out there know we pee all night long. We can get up five, six, seven times to pee, which the next day we're wiped out because we're so sleep, you know, deprived. deprived. I was going to say deficient. Um, so there's this new, sur not new, there's a surgery called Euro lift where they go up to the penis and they put a clip in your prostate and it opens the prostate up because when you get old, your prostate grows and it closes your urethra tube where you pee through. That's why you get up a hundred times a night. So now it's going to take about two or three weeks for it to work, but that's what I had done last week. And the procedure was nothing because after the procedure was over, Jimmy and I had a very important meeting that we had to do for a couple of hours. So there I was um, with the, uh, what is it called? Interesting day. The thing in your a catheter. I, was, I had a catheter with a bag on my leg where I was urinating. And he but, put it on Facebook to show everybody. <laughs> but, well, you know why I want everybody out there to know? to tell their fathers or grandfathers or great-grandfathers that there is now a solution to the prostate problem that uh, we get when we grow old. And I want the world to know it's called a Eurolift, and it works. And um, let's see. Now I have another week of healing uh, before it, it, it kicks in. Absolutely. So, so that was our last week. And then, of course, I'm not supposed to lift anything, the doctor said. And there I am lifting 20-pound boulders and digging holes. And this one has got the whip. Not true. Hitting me with the whip. He just has to do And then everything. I said to him, I said, I'd like water. And he said, no, I won't oh, give you yeah, any right. because I don't want to get arrested. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you know what? Hilarious. If that really is going on in Georgia... Why hasn't our current president done something about it? He talked about it in his speech, complaining about how if in Georgia you are in line to vote and somebody gives you water, you're arrested. Well, president, get rid of that law. Don't talk about it. For anybody who likes Larry David, they did like five episodes on it. It was very, very funny. I mean, really, this is like nonsense. What does this president do but just talk bad about everybody? Anyway. That's all he likes to do is complain. I, I'm not happy with this president, not at all. So B says it's good that you told everybody that. Told everybody what? About the prostate, because like it's a problem well, for everybody. Yeah, I wanted to share it because, you know, I have a, a, a lot of people that uh, listen to my stupidity. And I well, want we have them, an older audience, too. And I want them to know that every now and then some intelligence does come out of my mouth. And that's what it was. And it, it's a nothing surgery. I mean, it's a joke. I went in, they gave me Michael Jackson juice. They knocked me out. He went up my penis, put the thing in, came out of my penis, uh, and then gave me flowers. He was home like three hours late. Oh, three he didn't or four get the hours joke, and then he no, gave no, me no. flowers. Uh, and the doctor and I now are going to go pick out China. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> he fell in love. What can I tell uh, you? What can I you know, tell that's you? just a joke. That's a silly, silly, willy joke. I want to talk about my dear friend, Julian, Julian Schlossberg. He uh, has a radio show that's really uh, incredible because of the guests that he's got on. Uh, last week, he had Isabella Rossellini, Ingrid Bergman's daughter, and uh, the interview is stunning. Uh, and Julian is wonderful at what he does. For those of you who don't know who Julian is, look him up. He's a big shot in New York, Broadway, hung around with Barbara Streisand and all those folk. So, Actually, yeah, he had Martin Sheen. He had um, the guy from Turn to Classic Movies. 
Bill, Ben Mankiewicz. Yeah, I mean, he has He's got some really great guests. Really great guests. And his platform is on uh, is on Red Circle, just like ours, you guys. Um, so, so listen in, to listen Circle in to listen Julian Schlossberg. And our show with Julian is one of our biggest shows. I think we got uh, it was him and and uh, somebody else. Uh, Julian is coming. We got seventeen million plays. I think. Yeah, Julian is coming back on soon. So we could talk more about his radio show, also to talk more about his book, which is really a very, very uh, nostalgic book for people my age that came from Brooklyn or the Bronx. It's a, it's a lovely book, a lovely a little life story, and it's charming the way he wrote it. So I would suggest you get it. I forgot the title. I don't remember. I mean, I don't remember the title of anything in Actually, B. Claudia probably knows. She'll probably tell us. Yeah, B. Claudia <laughs> what's Julian's she book? Bought what's it. Julian's book name, B? Do you remember? I don't remember. I'm sorry, you guys, but that, that he's a good friend of ours, but I don't remember anybody's book's name. Oh, I love him. He's my buddy. He's been so good to me. Uh, a, a man with his kind of importance and power who has absolutely helped me uh, cast my movie. He gave me Renee Taylor. Uh, he's giving me Carol Kane. Uh, he's just been wonderful. He's been very supportive. I wish that there were more people like him in our business. Maybe we'd have better movies made. Absolutely. All right. So um, we want to thank everybody for tuning in every week. We kind of fell out of the charts when we didn't have a show last week. So we dropped to like the top 100 instead of the top 20. Uh, so we want to get back up there so you can listen to the Jimmy Star Show with Ron Russell on Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, iTunes, Spotify, Amazon Music, YouTube, Radio Public, TuneIn, Pandora, and Amazon Prod. The video is on YouTube and soon will be on uh, a couple other uh, Roku and a couple other video uh, networks. But right now it's mostly streaming the audio and we want everybody to take a listen. Now what do they do, vote for us? No, you just listen. The more people that listen, that's how the rankings are done. The more well, people you, that listen, you it don't goes only up. have to listen; you can watch. I prefer watching us than to listening because you know sometimes we say things that you can't get because you're not seeing it. I know, but most people listen, so yeah, I know. If you're in the car, it's nice to listen, but if you're near a machine of some kind and you can see us, I would prefer that you watched us because you know uh, conversations. Uh, are good, but when a conversation has an actor in the conversation, you get a performance. Example, it's raining out. Did you see all that rain coming down? Oh, my God, it was flooded. That you don't get when you just listen. You see it, and it makes a sentence far more important. The only thing about that is... What is it, what is it about that? Now, contradict me. Yes, well, we get paid for people to listen to it. All the streaming platforms, um, iTunes, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, uh, all the different things. Okay, so we get, did you say paid? Yeah, we get paid. In, in American currency? Yes, we get paid. How come I don't see any of it? I tell you how much we make, and you just, and I tell you I'm using it. I use it to live. We used to you live. You use it to live. <laughs> On that little, but in the meantime, wait a second, hold it. What? I know what it costs to live. I doubt we make that much money. We don't. That we could pay to live. It pays our electric bill. No. <laughs> it, pay, it buys the dog food for yeah. our three dogs. Actually, our dog food's expensive. It's like four to fifty dollars a bag now. <laughs> I know. Everything's expensive. Everything's expensive. 30, so anyway, wait, thirty bucks for a car wash. Could you believe that? My little car, it's this big, and it was $30 to get a car wash. I, I almost fainted. Hilarious. In the meantime, you guys, please listen to us. Apple no, Podcast is the best not place. Not $30, $39. No, it was $30 plus tip, tax and tip. You no, probably... it was almost $40. No, it's $32, I know. I, mean, I get my car washed there all the time. Okay. You never told me how much it cost. Yeah, I did. You were with me. <laughs> So we go to the car wash yeah. place. He's actually with me. He sees the sign. I say I'm going to get the car wash. Attention. He doesn't pay any attention. So then he goes on his own when I'm not with him, and he has a heart attack because it's $30. Because when I go with Jimmy, I go sit outside in the sun because, you know, they have lounges out there. And I don't care what, what's going on. I don't pay attention to trivia like that because if I did, I wouldn't have time to be so intelligent. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and fill my head with yeah. intelligence. All right, we're going to bring on our first guest. So let's bring him on.
Look at you. Hey, Brett, how you doing? How are you? Can you guys hear me good? Yes, yeah. we can hear you good. Any chance oh, you can turn your phone sideways or whatever that is? Does it go sideways or no? Well, we'll try here whether... There we there go. There go. Now we could see the cop. Now we're equal. We could see the cop. All right. Sure. Hey, all right. Now we're going to actually uh, do it. So I have to ask a question, but first I'm going to introduce you as Brett Wagner, Big Swag, a.k.a. Lost Leatherface. How's that? That works. I'll take right. all. <laughs> now we want to welcome to the Jimmy Star Show with Ron Russell, actor, host, author, horror icon, Brett Wagner, a.k.a. Big Swag, a.k.a. Lost Leatherface. Hello and welcome to the show. Hey, it's great to be on here with you guys. You know, I've I've run into you two uh, over many years, uh, different events and different red carpet stuff, and it's just nice to be able to come on here and shoot the shiznit with you. Absolutely. And that's exactly what we're going to do. And that's do. exactly what we do. And I have to tell you, so you know, Ron, already, we have a cool. chat room filling up. Just say hi to people in the chat room. You look good, by the way. What are you doing to yourself? Getting good sleep or what? <laughs> no, I don't sleep at all very well. Uh, you know, I was uh, over the weekend, I was uh, emceeing a, a drag race event, not RuPaul's drag race, but cars. Although I, I would work for RuPaul if she asked me. Uh, but I was in uh, Arizona. So I was uh, there for three days, got a little sun. Beard's getting a little whiter. Once you're out in the sun, that thing gets a little white. Uh, your face looks good. How tall now, are you? Now, wait a minute. RuPaul, I wouldn't work for that bitch if she begged me. Because you know <laughs> why? I used to do drag for many years. I impersonated Jane Russell. And I was very famous and very good at it. And I sang in my own voice. And believe it or not, I did look like her. Now, I, I look, I do not look like anybody. Um, but I went to one of the events that RuPaul did. And she was charging fifty dollars. No, five hundred. Oh, five hundred dollars <laughs> to go and shake her fag hand. <laughs> all right, and meet her in the back room. And the line, and the line was six blocks long. So I said, for five hundred dollars, is she giving head in the back room? <laughs> I mean, what is she doing in the back room for five hundred? <laughs> Since when does a drag queen? I wouldn't pay five Get five hundred bucks. To shake her hand. I mean, that's obscene. And I oh, thought, she, she, no, she's a famous drag queen, and she's got a very popular does, TV well, show. Fame does not entitle you. <laughs> but, but the, the fame, I don't see. I wrote about that on Facebook because when people become famous, they think that their signature is important and their persona is important. Meanwhile, when there's nobody that wants them anymore. They do a two dollar horror movie like Betty Davis and Joan Crawford did. Big shit stars that they were. Look where they wound up in a crappy movie. Well, I mean, it was actually unbelievable. I, I mean, he's knocking it. But I mean, you so know, we she, went to this thing. It was in the convention I, center. I know that bitch. Hang on, let me talk. And we she's saw, not nice. <laughs> we, yeah, RuPaul, she wasn't nice. RuPaul but, is not nice. But we she's went to a her very event, nasty and there was drag queen. there was there was probably. Seriously, and I've been to many, many conventions over my life. Um, it was almost like a Comic Con. There were so many people. I bet there was thirty thousand people, you know, waiting to get in, and they had everybody there. Um, and, and it was unbelievable. But I wouldn't do it again, though, because it's just not not my thing. I, I would go for all the horror icons, like I used to go all the time, you know, and go sure. see. So the first time I met you, I have to tell you. So first of all, how does the big swag? So what is? Because you're big swag everywhere. Your website's bigswag.com. So what does that actually mean? So when I was uh, coming up, uh, you know, and I was probably 21, 22 years old, I, actually, I was working a bar called Smalls in Hollywood. And uh, my last name's Wagner. My friend used to call me Schwagner, Schwagner, one of the doormen I worked with. And when I got into pro wrestling, I tried to, uh, you know, I was doing at the time I was the voice of Monster Garage and I, I was called Big Schwag. So I got into pro wrestling. I was the Big Schwag. I was doing the voiceovers for Discovery Channel's Monster Garage. I tried to brand that name. And so a lot of folks that used to watch Monster Garage and hear my voice or whenever at the occasion I would get to host, I was the big swag. So, and so then, you, uh, yeah, so it just kind of stuck. And I, I still, you know, some people know me as Brett Wagner. Some people know me as the swag. So it just kind of stuck. So how tall are you? I, I think it's terrific. and. Well, if if people don't know what swag means, 
they can use their imagination. And when they say big swag, a lot of you know people can get horny. Well, my my wife may my wife may tell you different, but um, uh, <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, um, I'm I'm about I was a true a true six five until I got into my fifties. Now I'm about six six four and three quarters. I've, I've you shrink a little bit yeah. when you get with age. I'm six foot now. I used to be six one and a half. So all the times that we've met you, I have to like tell you. Wait, though. I lost a half inch in height. Thank God, not you know where. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so all the times that we've met you, uh, I really, I always just thought you were like the Sons of Anarchy guy for some reason because a lot of times you were hanging, you'd be hanging out with that other guy that was on Sons of Anarchy, and I just automatically assumed you were like the Sons of Anarchy guy. And it wasn't until like a didn't year you, after the first. Didn't you know he was Leatherface? No, the, no. Until like a year after the first time we met you, I had no idea. I basically just thought you were like a Sons of Anarchy guy. Uh, and then after we met you like the third time, maybe I was like, I'm gonna like look this guy up and just see what he's done. And then I saw all the stuff you did, and then I was like all pissed off that I didn't like, uh, you know, you. know who you were. No, I talked to him, but I was just uh, I would have had better questions and things to talk about if I would have known he had done all yeah, these amazing well, things. Um, you know, you were, you were Rusty Coons was our friend that was yeah, but, on the Sons of Anarchy, Big Rusty. Um, you know, I've been acting since I, I've been 21, 22 years old. So over the time as a big guy in Hollywood, you're going to over, a, you know, that I'm 56 now. So that's a long time. And so you will audition and, I, you know, I've got over 110 credits, but that's because of the longevity that I've lasted in the business. And you'll eventually... You may not book something, but, you know, two years later, you'll book that show. And so I've done a lot of stuff and Disney, you know, I, I love doing the the kids stuff, but I've done everything. So episodes of Sons of Anarchy, I've done a lot of the horror movie stuff, which I wanted to do when I was a young guy. I, I got into acting because I wanted to do horror movies and I've been blessed okay. to do a few. What was your favorite horror movie when you were younger? Man, there there's so many, but. I got to go with George Romero's 1978 Dawn of the Dead. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. It's a great movie. And, you know, I mean, we can go into, I love a lot of the Hammer films and Christopher yes. Lee as Dracula and Peter Cushing and all that stuff. And then, you know, there's, I, I even like these, a lot of cheesy horror flicks. There was one called Children Shouldn't Play With Dead Things that uh, <laughs> I, I would sure love the remake just because of the title. I was at a cocktail party in Beverly Hills when I lived there. And Christopher Lee was at that party with his wife. Wow. So he was very tall, by the way. He was about your height. And I cornered him. And I said to him, you know, Christopher, I so love your Dracula movies. You do such a good job with them. He turned around and looked at me down and said, I do more than Dracula movies. <laughs> and I said, excuse me. Uh, but that's what you're known for. Oh. I am not. I am. And he went into Shakespearean theater in England. I mean, he gave me his whole friggin' resume about what his background was. And I said, that's wonderful. And his wife was standing there and she came over to me and she said, don't listen to him. She said, no one does. <laughs> <laughs> well, you you know, know, some, Ron, sometimes you get known for a niche thing and, and it's okay. You know, there, thank goodness there's a, uh, there's enough to go around and enough movies. And I think a lot of guys, um, Angus Scrim, who played the tall man in all the yeah. Phantasm movies. A Angus was a classically trained, uh, you know, Shakespearean actor. And then, but what is he known for? He's known for Phantasm. And I think, I think a lot of people eventually they'll accept it and go, all right, yes, that's, yeah, that's who but, I am. And but it may take some time. Christopher Lee should be grateful because he made a ton of money. A lot of money with Dracula, so he could have said. And I think me, he's the great Dracula. Yeah, and I think that's the only thing I ever saw him in that I liked him in. I've seen him in other work, and he was okay. He was nothing exciting or special, but when he did Dracula, he really uh, was acting, and I thought his performance was wonderful. And I was being sincere in the compliment because I've seen so many Dracula people who never really did it. Christopher Lee. When when the camera came in for the close up and his eyes were on fire, and he <laughs> hissed, he was really frightening. He, he was, and I thought he was a wonderful actor to portray Dracula. 
I'm I sorry that he was. But anyway, he got nicer as the evening went on because I was with Red Ske Red uh, Red Red Skeleton, Red uh, uh, Red Buttons, and Red Buttons' wife, and Red Buttons. I don't think cared for Chris that much, and they sort of were going not back and forth, but there was a little bit of um, I'm I'm more famous than you at this party. Kind of thing. You know how they get when you have two celebrities at a party? Of course. So I like they were, they were kind of fighting for my attention and other people's attention. So wait, I want to go back. So first of all, let's brag a little bit for you. So you guys, first of all, you you uh, even though you are kind of you kind of are a little bit pigeonholed that you've done a lot of big horror stuff. Um, you've been in some really big films, you know, that have nothing to do with horror and television shows. Uh, I was super impressed with all of it. So here's some of the TV shows, you guys, that you might have seen uh, the big swag in. Um, the TV show Mom, that's a comedy. Sons of Anarchy. Hannah Montana with Miley Cyrus. Uh, the Mentalist, NCIS, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Angel. The Bold and the Beautiful, which we have a million friends that are oh, on that. Uh, yeah. Touch, Castle, we Castle and Weeds. Um, and I know there's more of them. I just picked those out because I, I basically know people on all of them. And uh, so it made it a lot of fun. And then some of the big movies, you guys, that he's been in that you wouldn't uh, maybe even have expected. He was in. I didn't see. Now I didn't see this movie, and I don't know if it it didn't do but that well. The, title. the Happy Time Murders with Melissa McCarthy, Elizabeth Banks, Joel McHale, and Maya Rudolph. How was that? Like, was that fun? Because that's like it's like it's kind of like a Muppet. Like it's humans and Muppets together, right? Yeah, I don't. I, I you know, I don't think we legally we could have we could have we said Muppets, but it was uh, yeah, it was fun, man. I mean, you know, I play a, a thug in prison beating up one of the the puppets, and uh, <laughs> but you know, getting to see uh, McCarthy and her husband there, who are you know just brilliant, uh, brilliant right. people. I mean, it's I, and I love comedy, and I and you know. People like that. You know, the first movie I ever did was Bicentennial Man with Robin Williams. Oh, wow. And getting to watch Robin Williams, you know, and I was a young guy and getting to watch him on on the set. You know, he would, uh, he would in between takes, he would start a joke. And Christopher Columbus, our director, was a very famous guy, very, great director. He would say, okay, let's, let's shoot this scene. And Robin would uh, stop the joke. And then when he said cut, he would finish the joke. <laughs> And, you know, and I'm just like, this is amazing. And here's the, f so the last day I was shooting there, I decided to do a joke and I started the joke and everybody was like, looking at me, like, what are you doing? And then I, I finished the joke and Robin Williams is like, stick to your day job, kid, stick to the day job. And then everybody's laughing. And he was so nice that I reminded him uh, of that years later. And he was like, oh yeah. And he was such a nice guy. But I think, the Melissa McCarthy's, the Robin Williams, um, some their their mind works so much faster than ours. On the they see things that before we see them, they see the humor and things, and it's it's always wonderful to sit on a set and watch. I got to work with John Malkovich, and watching his brain process stuff is amazing as well. So I like love it when you do stand up comedy uh, without a script, just a what we call a clothesline. Uh, <clears throat> You have to be that way. I did stand up for 64, how many years? Uh, since I was 19. So, He's 84. So I, so I, He'll be 84 next week. I worked every nightclub every uh, in drag as Jane Russell live, and I very rarely had a script. Uh, whatever came in, I was kind of like them, and I know how it works. It's, it's a given... Uh, talent it's something that you're born with as a kid i was that way and i'm sure robin was but you can't learn it you cannot learn to be spontaneous quick and very funny as jimmy will tell you i'm always wise cracking and coming up with crap actually my favorite comedian is like that Do you, have you ever heard of matt reif oh of course i think matt reif is probably the funniest guy out there right now and he is so funny and and he doesn't have it scripted because he interacts with the audience and so it can't yeah. be scripted I like Matt Reif, he's making a lot of money right now. He is, uh, you know, it helps. It helps that he's a good-looking dude because a lot of his humor with the audience has to do with his looks. But he's great. He's tremendous. My picture, actually, because you might think I'm a, I'm a little nuts. No, he won't. But How so can you look like we Jane actually Russell? saw Matt Wright because he's an actor also, and we went to yeah. a movie premiere in a movie called Elevator with uh, Eric Robertson, who's not the model lady that we like. Oh, so I much. love her. 
Uh, 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 Eugenia Kuzmina, Eugenia Kuzmina, and he was the son. He played their son. I love Eugenia. And, She's uh, so beautiful. and he was, you know, he was really good in the movie. But I didn't really think that much about him. And then, like a month later, I saw him do stand up, and I was like, oh my god, he's like the funniest. I thing did I've movies ever seen. in the early part of my life, but I never went anywhere because I was too ethnic looking, black hair. I looked Puerto Rican or Greek or whatever, and they wanted Tab Hunter, Troy Donahue, and J Jeffrey Hunter. They wanted your look, blue eyed blonde Americana. Uh, we, I don't know if he'll be able to see this. Let's see. Hold that's on. That's me when I impersonated Jane Russell. Oh, wow. So, oh, no, he looks see, really good. I look just like her, and I became her friend, you know, for many, many years, best, best friends. So, he even had boobs. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, wow. I mean, that dress, and too. This is, this is him then with the actual with the Jane real Russell. Jane Russell. Wow. You know who Jane Russell is, right? You know, of course, of course. Of course he knows who Jane Russell is. But as I said, getting back to what you said, uh, Robin Williams Brilliant. was a little insane, a little disturbed. I'm sorry what he did to himself. He did, he did deprive the, the world of, of joy and happiness by committing suicide, that was selfish. But I think he was very troubled. Um, it's sad. And he was it one is. of the talents. But I, I enjoyed his work so much. So, yeah, that, I, you know, the thing about people, their minds move that fast. You know, a lot of them in, entertainers, when they, when they see the stuff that we don't get to see, I think a lot of them um, have issues with depression and... Uh, I, I don't know what it is, but, you know, a lot of people that are very creative and they can move that fast and their mind works that fast. I think that's just their mind's always moving and not stopping. And I think that's what happened with Robin you and know some of I, the other people. The other person that I found who I knew, Debbie Reynolds. Quick. Oh, my God. Was Debbie fast. Debbie, you could say to her horse and she in one second come up with three horse strokes. And I was stuck in a limo. Stuck. I was honored to be in a limo with Joan Rivers here and Debbie Reynolds here, and me in the middle. I, it's a long story how I got there. And more fucks were flying, and more jokes were going. And those two went after each other about old bad jokes and stuff. I mean, I said to them, I said to Joan, I said this should be filmed. She said never. <laughs> never. <laughs> Never. Yo, hang on. I'm going to show a picture real quick. Go ahead, throw it up, Juan. Juan's going to throw up a picture. There you go. There's Ron. That way you can actually see it. So that's Ron when he impersonated. Oh, Jane that Russell was young, good old young days. Look at that pretty girl. <laughs> Look at that dress. I need yeah. that dress. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Juan. That's uh, just fun. And I work only straight clubs. I never work. Well, I, that's not true. I worked the townhouse because my friends owned it and I did it as a favor. But I only worked straight clubs uh, all over the country. And I was quite famous in New York. Uh, they had, I remember seeing posters of myself on lamp posts and stuff. And I thought, wow, that was big. Back then, for a drag queen, you know, to get that kind of notoriety was amazing. So I imagine. We were thought of as, as degenerates, freaks, and nut jobs, you know, crazy fags that want to be women. They didn't realize that we were artists and performers. I sang in my own voice, and I did stand-up. What am I talking about myself? It's your interview. I know. So I want to go to him for a second. <laughs> so he, you did another movie. I'm, 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 I'm tying this movie in because of the comedy thing. And it was called Fool's Paradise. A lot of big people. Charlie Day, Kate Beckinsale, Ken Jong, Adrian Brody, Jason Bateman, Ray Liotta, Jason Sudeikis. And I want to know... So, because I think Ken Jong is super funny now. I didn't even know him probably like who he was, you know, uh, back at that time. But was he funny then too? Because he's hilarious now. Yeah, now I, I got to watch him on the set work a little bit. Yeah, he's great. He's amazing. He's another guy that's very quick that can find the humor. And, you know, and Charlie Day is just uh, all my scenes were with Charlie Day, the couple that I had, and and with uh, John Malkovich. Charlie Day is such a great guy. And he's so funny that all those stars that you just mentioned, he, he, you know, he produced this movie. He, he, he backed the movie with his own money. So he pulled in all those favors and the movie is very funny, but yeah, you know, anytime as an actor that you get to work with people that you, cause now it, it for me, 
you know, I mean, I've been doing it a long time. So whenever I get, I get excited when I get to go, you know, work with a John Malkovich or something for me, it's, I'm still like a, a, you know, kid in a candy store when I get to work with some of these people, or if I get to go sign at a convention and there's some horror movie celebrities there that I grew up watching or that I watch or the, you know, directors, it's always, uh, it's always a blessing. And I get, I get, I get really excited to do that. Like, you know, I'm going to be signing at monster Palooza, in a week and a half, and I've never ever signed a Monster Palooza in Pasadena, and I'm 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 real excited to go there because I have, I'm a fan of a lot of the people that are going to be there signing. So, who are some of the people? No, wait a minute. Wait, 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 I mean, no, I'm going to keep. I'm going to continue with that. Who are some of the people like when you were growing up that now you get to meet that you get a kick out of? Who have been some of those? Oh. people? So uh, the director of Phantasm, Don Coscarelli, and Beastmaster was another one of his movies. I got to be in a in a movie with uh, that he directed uh, called John dies at the end. And, uh, you know, that's just, it was an incredible experience. Um, you know, of course, meeting Robin Williams, uh, Robert Patrick, the Terminator, Terminator two. So I, love I, I know Robert really well. Now we ride Harleys together here and there. And, uh, he's a great guy. And, um, gosh, you know, I, I was big fans with Alice and Janney, a big fan of Alice and Janney. And then when I got to do mom, I was just like in awe. See, that's because she's quick and she's a great, great actress. And uh well, Phantasm for me, so Phantasm was the first one, was one of the first movies that uh, I got to go see like on my own without my parents. It was like my, my first horror movie that I ever got to go see on my own. That one in Phantom of the Paradise. And oh. um, and uh, and I actually became really good friends with Michael Baldwin. I produced a movie with him called Brutal, and uh, he was the star of it. Um and so Phantasm for me is like one of the greatest, and there's so many of them. Uh, you know, I don't know how many there are. There's probably like seven of them or something now, but the first I'm, two were amazing. I'm not really a, a connoisseur on horror movies, but is Leatherface what you're most famous for? Well, because I that- mean, so <clears throat> Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the 2003, um, there's two of us that play Leatherface. I uh, got cast as Leatherface, and, uh, uh, you know, a couple of days in the shooting, I got heat stroke. So, they oh. had to bring another guy in. But I do the first kill in the movie, which is the most important kill in the movie. And, um, yeah, it was uh, – yeah, people in the horror movie convention, it's a big deal. Even if you played Leatherface for three minutes, it's uh, – you know, there's yes, very I few know. guys. Uh, I, 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 I know, like I know that face. character, and I know that name out of everything else you mentioned. <laughs> now, when you go to signings, are you signing because of Leatherface? People are coming over, oh, my God, you're Leatherface? Yes, 100%. Well, I mean, I've done other stuff. The Crazies, John Dies at the End, you know, Buffy and Angel, uh, you know. But, uh, yeah, people, the, the Leatherface thing, is is a, it's a huge deal. Because it's, we've it, had on our show how many? We haven't had Leatherface. No, no. How many of those other ones? Oh, we've had everybody. No, we've, no, no. The one we've had. We've had we've had about five or six guys. We've had every Jason. We've had, had we've had yeah, we've, had, we've had, had about five yeah, actors on our every show single person. that have played Jason. And I'm and pretty good friends minute, with Jimmy, a lot just of them. Just a second, honey. This, I don't understand this venue. I know you're excited, <laughs> but we have to eat. You know, we have to. You know, I'm not going to sit here playing with myself. Although that would be a good thing to do, <laughs> yeah. because you know nothing else happens. But um. Jason, five. No, I forgot. We've had Freddy. Was, so go back. I'm going somewhere with it to you. So how? Oh many, yeah. Wait a second. Oh. Would you ever like to play Jason, or do you like playing? Oh. You like you like killing parts. Or you like. Playing no, I mean, I, 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 there's something about getting in makeup and uh, doing the whole process and sitting in the chair and um, and then getting out there and being something that you're not. Uh, I find it easier to be under a costume than having to sit there and try to cry on film or something, you know, uh, playing, a, playing a big bad guy is, is much easier when you look like me than it is to opposed to uh, having to play, a, you know, a, an older father to some kid and I got to cry on camera, you know, or something like that. That's, that's, that's a little tougher and playing the brute, playing the bad guy. It just seems to be easier because when I grew up, that's the stuff I liked. That's the stuff that, you know, attracted me to being an actor. I'm happy that I'm in a film where I'm not a mafia, I'm not a priest, and I'm not whoever else. Cop. Those are I three am big a things. vampire. I have <laughs> never, ever, in all the films I'm in, ever played anything other than who I am. So now that's going to be fun when they convert me into this um, interesting 
a weird vampire, a gay vampire. I can see you as a vampire. That'd be great. I can't wait. And I have, uh, it's, it's a wonderful f script. To, uh, I'm teaching my daughter to be a vampire, and I take her to an enchanted land. It's a wonderful, wonderful script, so different from any vampire movie. And they're going to do me not like the Christoph the the, uh, the traditional vampire. I'm going to be some sort of an interesting vampire. So that's fun. Would you like to play a vampire? Oh man, would I like to play a vampire? I mean, I, I you know, um, yeah. There's you know, there, there's some some actors have been able lucky enough. Uh, you know, there's a couple guys who have played Leatherface. They played Jason. They played Michael Myers, and that's the very select few. But I love, uh, you know, I have a movie coming up. Uh, I'm going to be shooting in August called Clown Motel Three. Ah, yeah, that's right. He plays General Milan. I'm General Milan. That's right. So I get to play. Uh, well, I mean, some kind of uh, leather facey clown. You know, I'm, I'm rod. <laughs> You're a Not clown. A lot to talk about, but I, I'm real excited about that. I mean, I, I love um, as much as I love auditioning for you know Marvel movies and and you know hit TV shows and all this stuff, which you know happens uh, time to time. I love the independent film world and some of these guys, you know the the Joseph Kellys from uh, Clown Motel and some of these guys, directors and writers, they're they're going to be the next big thing. And to be able to get in on some of these independent movies and work with these young directors and these actors is great because it's you're working and uh, get to play something cool, which I've never played before, which is a little clowny. So I'm excited. Maybe, maybe I get to kill you. Uh, I haven't gotten my, well, I hope not. Joe keeps making the my clowns don't die. Remember? <laughs> no, they're in the first Ron was in the second one. You no. Know, yeah. yeah. The clowns um, come back as ghosts. So he's, he's a ghost. He's not really there. He's a ghost clown. We don't know that. Oh. We don't know what. Yeah, he's doing. I know that. Uh, Joe, you're not supposed to Joe, say that. I'm not supposed to say that. <laughs> Joe, you're not supposed to say that stuff. Joe hasn't given me my script yet. He said, "I keep adding to it, Ron. Your part gets bigger and bigger." And I said, "Listen, we're shooting in 120 degrees of weather. Did you know that when we shoot in Nevada, we're going to be in the desert yes. in August in 120 what? degrees of weather?" Yes. Without air conditioning? Well, you're going to, I'm going to be at, uh, by the Lake Mead. So I'm going to be a little bit cooler. And uh, if I get too hot, I'll just jump in the, the lake. Uh, so. Did you get your script? Uh, I do not have a script yet. No, nobody does. So hey, we just got to plug it. So but he's a very good, I love Joe. Joe's like my buddy. And I called, we spoke, and he said, nobody's got a script yet. I'm still writing it. I said, Okay. Uh, you have a cast of thousands, Joe. <laughs> I'm grateful to say that I'm one of the actors who's being paid. I don't, I'm not <laughs> paying to be in it. So I was, I'm being paid a salary. I don't pay to get in movies. They pay me. And I make that very clear to everybody. <laughs> Um, no, I make that so we want to go back because we had to cast a clown motel we had a bunch of the producers and people on like two or three weeks ago when the Indiegogo campaign so we should tell everybody listen you guys clown motel they've added all kinds of great people including uh, including Brett and um, uh, a whole bunch of other people Jenna Jameson and the kid from the poltergeist Oliver Oliver Robbins, Oliver Robbins Eileen right? Dietz Eileen Dietz uh, they've added a bunch of people to it, you guys. So if you want to contribute to the Indiegogo campaign and be a part of it, you can go to Indiegogo.com and just plug in, type in Clown Motel Three Ways to Hell, and it'll come up. They have all kinds of great perks, and please join because we need to make raise lots of money to make the whole thing go. Right. Yes. Uh, I love it. It's going to be fun, so we'll get to actually uh, – Unfortunately, be with you. that's what some people have to do nowadays to do a film. Years ago, the studio owned – the property and all you did was go to work and know your lines and go to work and they took care of all the finance and today with all the independent work the quality of films are not very good because a lot of these films are $150,000 films and as much as the, the producers and the writers are talented they don't have the funds to make their thoughts come forward and this is what I've my seen, objection. No, this is what film. my objection is, that we have a lot of people who are not actors who have never acted in their life, 
putting money in a film to be in the film. Now, I know I've spoken to a few actors that have been in the, that situation. I'm an actor for 50,000 years. I know how to do, you know how we know how to manipulate, we know how to do. These people stand there stage struck, and if you have to get something from them, they can't give it because they don't know how. So you look yeah. like a show off, or you look like you're grandstanding, or you look like shit. And this is my objection. And I say to these people, I would rather not be in a scene with someone who's not a professional actor. And you have to state all these things nowadays. Otherwise, yeah. otherwise you're going to look like hell. No, and I, and I and that's the catch twenty two with raising money, funding, you know, crowdfunding. That sometimes you are going to get actors that uh, that are not they're not actors; they're fans, and they want to. You know, yes, that's right. To, be, to be to come be in Clown Motel Three and to work with me, I'm, I'm there's a, there's a couple of scenes where you get to there's well there's one scene where I I, mean, I can talk about it. I'm going to kill four or five people. So. Uh, but usually, uh, and I know some of the people that have already got the perks and they're okay actors, but usually if it's something like that, I can work with someone real quick beforehand. And as long as they don't have a whole bunch of dialogue, you can usually <laughs> work something. You can usually work something out with them and get it done. I mean, if you would have told me, if I would have known how big Terrifier 2 was going to be and uh, how big that movie would have been, and that was crowdfunded. And I had some people, I would have paid to be in that movie. And I, I, I don't, I wouldn't, I don't want to pay to be in a movie. I'm an actor. I've been doing it like you, uh, Ron, for a million years. But yeah. sometimes you, you, sometimes you, these, these films, and the directors and the actors in it are so good that I just want to be a part of something like that. And I think a lot of people see this and they want to be a part of something special, whether it's the director, whether it's you know. So you have to understand, we're in the business to work to get paid. Yeah. Now, for Jimmy and I to drive into Hollywood from Palm Springs in our big, big truck that we Mercedes thing that uses a, a gallon a minute, the gasoline is a hundred something dollars to go and come. Also, if we stay overnight, that's so I'm going to be out three hundred dollars to be in a movie and not get paid. It doesn't make sense. I understand a hundred percent. I understand. So I think that we have to un, we have to get back to reality. And I told Joe Kelly, I, listen, the Mahal brothers I love. I love, love, love what the Mahal brothers do. If they had a $3 million budget, they'd knock the game out of the ballpark because they know how to do it. The Mahal brothers do a... Actually, a, do you know who the Mahal brothers are? Yeah, I can't get those guys to hire me at all for some reason, and I know them. Yeah, they just did bike, bikers no, versus I, werewolves. Because, yeah, because you have. Oh, to, you would have been great. Right. That. No, you know why they're not hiring you? Because you have to pay them. They only take people that give them money. No, that's not true. This, no, they true. have Robert oh. Lasardo and a few of my friends that I've worked with. They oh, were in the Robert, movie. They got Robert Lasardo. I mean, Robert is a big, big He's, ticker. He is too. He's like Robert Lasardo. Yeah. So, yeah. Ron, put in a good word for me. I will put in a good word for you. I will put in a good word for me. No, no, they're very. I talk to them a lot because they they like when I critique their movies uh, because I'm honest about their movies. They have some really good stories. They did a couple of good movies for the genre. You know, it wouldn't be feature film, but in the little world of little films. And the same thing with Joe Kelly. And I keep telling Joe, Joe, you got a good mind. You got to get a couple of million bucks. You got to go. Don't do this shit with this pay to play because it's going to be amateur. It's always going to look amateur. Your films are going to look amateur. People make fun of Clown Motel, you know. When I say I'm in Clown Motel, they laugh. They go hysterical. I don't know why they think it's so funny. But three, they said, but uh, you've been in all of them. I said, yeah, but Joe's my friend. You know, I help Joe out. See, I, I, I'm from a different because I'm different. I don't come from the old Hollywood system. So right now, I think that although no, I, don't, I don't wait, wait, let me talk. We have to bring back. I know, but you're no, not going to bring it back. Wait a second. We have to bring back angels, backers, investors. I know, but there aren't any. There are. The, the world is full of investors. They're just afraid. They, they're not being handled properly. Years ago, they knew how to handle an investor. The deck was really good. 
the picture was fabulous because they pitched it and to get the investor. Today, they don't know how to do it. The decks look like shit. No, my decks look No, we're great. not talking about your decks. I know, but I can't find I'm talking investor, about so. other decks that I've seen. I mean, really. And I'm talking about how they approach an investor. You don't create the movie to the investor. I have a movie. So-and-so is in it. So-and-so is in it. It's about a vampire who falls in love with Frankenstein. That's it. That's not how you get money. You got to say the vampire is gay. He's crazy. He's got a Frankenstein. <laughs> he's Jewish. He's, he's no. he made a bar mitzvah. You got to make a you the problem. Create. The problem with getting uh, films funded now, and I've worked on a lot of them. I, I, have, hear his I know. I want to first. I'm going to tell him what I've. Uh, all the investors, first of all, the first thing they ask is who's in it, obviously. I'm sure you know that. That's why a lot of people go to you because they want you in their films, you know, so they can try and get funding. But the second part of the problem is with streaming, people are not getting paid back. The streaming services, you know, are taking all the money and, and, and the investors are, are getting the whole very system, difficult. So the system the is whole bad. system stinks. We've but got I to change. No. I just I, don't, I think the floodgates have, have been open and I don't think they're going to shut. I don't think it's I mean, with with the two B's with uh, uh, Philo and all these new platforms, they need content. So whether the content is good or it's cheesy or it's terrible, they're still taking the content. They're still, you know, I mean, Amazon Prime and all this, they take movies that are, aren't the greatest, but it's still giving that film, that director and that producer, it's given them an avenue. Now, whether or not they get better or they just keep putting out some schlock, I mean, it's that they're, they're given, they're giving it out and it happens. And I've been in some schlocky movies. I mean, I've been in some hundred million, I've been in a couple hundred million dollar movies that were so bad that I was like, eee. Yeah, but, uh, and I've been in some independent movies that, you know, cost 150 grand and they're great. I mean, I have two, you know, I have two movies, Desert Fiends and Skate to Hell, which I, I shot Desert Fiends last year in Skate to Hell. And uh, they're, they're crowdfunded movies. And, but I think they, you know, they got some big people in them. And I think, uh, I, I think that these people, they're either going to get better or they'll disappear because the, the, eventually someone's not going to buy that crappy movie or, or not going to watch it. But I think the floodgates have been open, and I don't know if it's ever going to go back to where we just have studios or someone's going to say, "Hey, Jimmy, uh, let me read your script. Great, here's you know eight hundred thousand dollars. Let's shoot it, or here's two million. So, look, like Jimmy and Ron just dropped out, so that we're going to take a music break while they come back. Oh, okay. Uh, is that one? Yes, sir. How are you, buddy? Well, we could chat. Let's go. What are we chatting about, Juan? While while we're waiting for those guys. Where are you? Are you in Palm Springs or are you somewhere else? I am actually in South Florida. South Florida. See, I think the people would find that interesting. What part of South Florida are you in? I am in Wellington right now. Oh, Wellington. And uh, what kind of movies do you like? Uh, uh, I, I don't know. I'm more of an action sci-fi kind of guy. Oh, have you seen anything lately that you like? Or is there anything coming out that uh, you, you're interested in? Uh, not really. I mean, I'm still waiting for season four of Dark Matter. Oh, good show. Right. Great. <laughs> so far, we're on the same page. I like, you know, uh, I, the best series uh, that I've watched in the last couple of years, obviously, I, I, I loved Ozark. Ozark was so good, and I auditioned for so many parts, and I never got anything on Ozark. But I know they're bringing that back for a fourth season. So, I mean, they're going to do another season with that, that the whole cast has agreed to do, which is awesome. Nice. All right, um, so we have Jimmy and Ron that just came back. Hey, you guys, uh, I don't know what happened. Sorry, but I'm glad you kept talking. I have no idea what you said, uh, but I'm happy you kept talking because, I don't know, it said we lost our internet, even though my I, I was interviewing Juan. Good. I couldn't see him, yes. Juan's fabulous. Who Juan? Juan. Oh, Juan, our, our engineer. He's, yeah, he's fabulous. South yeah. Florida. Yes, we were chatting a little bit about that. Yeah, uh, but um, yeah, we were talking about independent independent filmmaking. Yes, a lot yeah. of this stuff is just not that good. And no, but, my, uh, my thing again is um, the investors. I know yeah. that I know they're out there because I. 
We watch a movie every night, Jimmy, after dinner. We watch a lot of Tubi, as a matter of fact. Every I night, love Tubi. Seven nights a week after dinner, we watch a movie. Every night. And I say to Jimmy, that movie got funded. That movie got funded. That movie's a piece of shit. Look at the actor. They stink. Look at the camera work. It's horrible. Look at the... the, the I, I critique everything. Got funded, Jim. It got funded. He looks it up. It got $14 million. It got $23 million. It got $6 million. It got $4 million. So I see there's... If, if everything on Tubi is getting funded... Why isn't Joe Kelly getting funded? You know why? Because Joe Kelly doesn't know how to go after the money. Everybody else does. Okay? We have guests on our show who have a movie and they're funded. And they got funded. So now we're going to say, oh, so the producers or the writers, directors, whoever they are, say, oh, blame it on the, the, the investors. Because that's what Renee Taylor told me. Renee Taylor, because I'm working with her in a movie said to me, Ron, don't buy it. It's all bullshit. There's plenty of money out there. She said, the people that say I can't find funding is because they don't know how. And, that, and you may be right. And you may be 100% right. And they don't know. I mean, I, 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 you know, I have friends. I have two friends that are billionaires, right? I've never decided to approach them and say, I have a script. You know, it's going to cost three to four million to shoot. But there's money out there. And you are 100% that there's money out there. I think, guys like Joe Kelly are, 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 you know, doing their dues right now. They're putting in the work. And I think a, a Joe Kelly, I think uh, there probably won't, there might not be a clown motel for, but I, I think that well, he's, will, he, it won't okay, be well, he's putting in the work now. So yeah. that somebody will uh, eventually, or he's going to get that right investor, you know, the Sean C. Phillips of the world, they're going to get that right investor and they're going to be able to, they're going to be able to, someone's going to say here, here's 500 grand. Do you know how many movies I could shoot with five hundred grand? I mean, I could probably shoot six with five hundred yeah, grand. With, with, well, what kind of know. what kind of CGI? What kind of actors? You know, it's it's a it's a it's the budget that stinks. And all these actors that are asking three and four million dollars. I mean, Jimmy is. We're trying to cast my movie, which is called the um, what is it called? The Cursed Gift of Magic. The, the Cursed Gift of Magic, where Renee Taylor plays a Jewish bookie. And I'm an Italian mafioso, 1943, and we're married, and we go out to kill the Nazis, okay? I like it's, it. Yeah, but you're not going to sell it. You know why? All the anti-Semitism that's going on. Backers are going to say, right now, your film, nobody's going to go see it, because everybody hates Jews. And, a, and this is a pro-Jewish movie. It makes her, a, 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 her like a Wonder Woman. This old Jewish lady becomes a, uh, a star. It's it's all pro Jew, and it's it's all for it's for Jewish people. So I said to Jimmy, maybe we should approach the synagogues and tell the synagogues. My movie shows people how good Jewish people are because it shows the Jewish life. My father was Jewish, so I know what I'm talking about. Uh, how, what it was like when you were Hamish, you're living in the house with the aunts and the uncles and eating back. The Second World War. We were wonderful people. The people today are not the people they were back in 1943. Yeah, it's, it's well, a you're going to need some Germans and Nazis, so I'm so ready. Get yes, Chris, there you go. We're trying to get Chris Walken to play the head of the Nazi there you go. party. But to get Chris Walken, it's an impossibility because his manager is not returning Jimmy's calls. Why? Because Jimmy's not giving a money offer. If Jimmy would say we're going to give him twenty million dollars, mm -hmm. Chris Walken will come running in my lawn in my house to tell me personally <laughs> he'll be in the movie naked. Let's naked. not forget he'd probably do it naked as well for twenty million. Yeah, so, so. you see what I mean? It's really difficult because yeah. you have. So I want to wait, I want to hear, hear your, So what has your been it's your experience? You work on so many films. I mean, by the way, to your, congratulations because Skate the Hell. Sean Phillips, you know, every movie he makes gets better, and Skate the Hell has some cast. Um oh, Skate the Hell's got uh, yeah. I mean it's uh um, Spencer Breslin, Robert Carradine, Jenna Jameson, Eric Roberts, Lisa Wilcox, Douglas Tate, Oliver Robbins, Eileen Dietz, Scott Schwartz, Todd Bridges, Robert Lasardo, you. I mean, that's some cast actually for an indie, you know, low budget film. Uh, yeah, he, he he is definitely getting better at what he does, and I think with Desert Fiends, and we're going to do a Desert Fiends too, 
and uh, a skate to hell. I, 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 he probably could do a sequel to this. I mean, he, he's stepping up. You know, yes. he's, he's he's raising more money and he's getting better actors, and he keeps getting better, better, better actors, and he's doing really well. And he works with a really good producer, Nicole uh, uh, yeah, Vegas. Also, yeah, she's been on the show. You know, so she's learning the business as well, and and, and uh, you know, I, I don't mind working for these guys. I, it's it's simple. They don't. Uh, some of these guys, they they trust you. Uh, Sean C. Phillips trusts me when I'm on the set, and he trusts that, uh, and he lets me, you know, maybe do some stuff that doesn't say in the script or you know the character. He and a guy like that is great when a director uh, trusts you um, to do uh, your job. And you come prepared to do your job. It's a wonderful thing. You know, that's why Clint Eastwood worked with the same guys over and over and over again. He trusts them. He knew they knew what they're doing on a set. And for you young actors that may be watching, you should, if you do get into some movies, you should watch and see how some of the people uh, carry themselves on a set or how they prepare for a scene. Because if the if you get in there and you do it and the director's like, great, and doesn't, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an awesome thing. Uh, in film, you can play, you can you can imp improvise, you can television. Forget about it. They yeah, want it. different, of oh, course. Oh, you can't do anything off. If they say, "Uh, you got to do uh," <laughs> even if you don't like uh, you can't say to the director, "Can I do ooh?" No, you have to do uh. Yes. Because, and you cannot drop a line or drop. That's why I hate television. I did television. I hated it. Oh, I never went back. I did what, about Charlie's Angels and McMillan. I did a couple, and I never went back. Never went back. I hate television. So hang on. we got eight minutes left, and I want to like, go over some stuff. you can play. You so, can. All right. What do you got for me, Jimmy? First, I want to give another, just another big prop that you were in Machine Gun Preacher, which that's some cast also. Oh, um, so let me tell you this. So, uh Christina Elise McCarthy, who's a great, who's a, who's a great actress and was on uh, Child. Child's yeah, Child yeah, Play 2, and um, at the time, we were real good friends, and she got me an audition for that movie with the casting people in Michigan, because that's where they shot a lot of it, and uh, I, you know, I'm a biker anyway, so I, I was on my bike, we shot the scene, they sent it to him, and the director uh, was like, that guy's such a believable biker. Well, yeah, because I am a biker, so I got the part, <laughs> I got to... I was shooting my TV show, which was called Pastime, which was a drag racing show. And I remember um, I would finish on Sunday and I had to fly to Detroit Monday morning because we were going to shoot with Gerard Butler, for God's sakes. You know, I mean, who wouldn't want to shoot with Gerard Butler? And I lost my voice. So for a day and a half, I'm drinking honey and tea and I I'd never even want to see honey again. And we got in there and I got to shoot my scenes with Gerard Butler. My voice was still but we got it done. And then we went in for ADR and I had to match that, that, that raspy voice that I had, which was tough. <laughs> so we go to Jimmy, I go to the, the red carpet premiere. That's when I just first started dating my wife uh, at the t my wife now, Dee Dee Bigelow or Dee Dee Wagner now. And uh, Gerard, I see Gerard on the red carpet and he comes over and he, he's like, you know, when I met him on the set, he said, call me Jerry. No one calls me Gerard. So I said, how you doing, Jerry? This is my wife. And he goes, hey, uh, um, listen, I hate to tell you, the movie was two hours and 45 minutes, and we had to get it down to like two hours and 15 minutes, so we had to cut your scenes out. <gasps> oh, wow. But I thought it was so cool that a man of his, you know, the lead actor of the movie would come over and was nice enough to tell me before we walked in there that I got your scenes got cut. I mean, a lot of people wouldn't even care about that, but he, he was nice enough to come tell me before he walked in. I had to explain to my wife, oh, that's where my scene was supposed to be. That's okay, though. At least you got to work with him. I mean, it's still on your resume. It's a memory you'll never forget. He's such a... Never. Cute. Yeah, it was great. Great how guy. Was, how was Michelle Monaghan? Because like, she's one of my favorite actresses. I mean, she's a great actress. I, I did get to watch her work a little bit, a couple days. And I mean, she's a professional out there. And, and uh, there's something about working. You know, I did the movie, The Crazies and uh, Timothy Oliphant. Great. Guy. People would say, say what, is he, is, is he really fun on the set? And I said, oh, he's, he's all business on the set. And people think, take that the wrong way. I'm like, listen, he's a, he's a good actor. And he, and he was professional on the set. 
when I saw him at the red carpet for the crazies, he came over and shook my hand and was smiling. He's like, Hey man, our stuff turned out really good. Didn't it? Different guy, you know, but on the set, he was very professional and, uh, and I can respect that. And, and, um, yeah, he's a great, another guy. It's a, just a tremendous actor and a fun we guy. Had, we had Lynn Lowry on a couple of weeks ago and she was <clears> in the original <throat> one. Plus she had a cameo. So here's the question I like to ask everybody, uh, bucket list. Um, first of all, if you could have been in any movie that's ever been made in history, what movie would you like to have been in? And then the second half of the question is uh, male and female actor uh, that you would like to work with that you have not had an opportunity to work with yet. Oh, wow. You put me on the spot here. Um, <laughs> it's gosh, you know, uh, I'll tell you, you know, one of my I, I'm a guy. I'm a guy that loves the seventies. I think the movies and the, in the late sixties and in the seventies were so much better than what we have today. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, that's where movie star comes from, right? Movie stars came out of that period. That's uh, uh, the outlaw. Josie Wells is one of my favorite movies with Clint Eastwood. I would have, I would have died to have been in that movie and, and been playing one of those characters. Um, uh, Clint Eastwood. I mean, you know, I don't know how my how many more years we're going to have him left, but he still keeps. I, I I would really love to work with Clint Eastwood, and even if it's just for a couple of lines for him to direct me. Um, and, and I really w I want to work with Allison Janney again. She oh, was yeah. so nice, uh, and so and and my wife came down the night that we uh, had the live audience, and they let her come on the set. And Allison always remembers my wife, so whenever she's at at a function. And she sees my wife. She goes and says hello. And to me, that's that's you know that's somebody yeah. that she and you know she's a working girl and she can remember that is great. So I'd love to work with her again. She's actually in that Apple TV show uh, right now. We watched it all. Um, that takes place in Palm Beach. I forgot the name of that show, but she's the uh, it was called one of the main um, stars of it, and it was really interesting. It was a good. I mean, it was a, it was a little weird at the end, but it was good. <laughs> Yeah, and, and you know, I think they're going to do another season of Ozark. I think the whole cast is has signed off to do that. And boy, would I—I I mean, I, boy, would I love to be on Ozark? Yeah, that would be a good yeah. one. That's like a given. So, all right, yeah. so you guys, this is Brett Wagner. You can check out his website. It's bigswag.com. Uh, he's on Instagram as the Big Swag. Uh, I think where do you usually post all your like signing dates and stuff? Is that mostly uh, on Instagram? Facebook and Facebook and Instagram. Brett Wagner on Facebook, the uh, Lost Leatherface <clears throat> on Facebook, and I mean at Instagram. It if I, I I'm one of the smart guys, so I click that little switch. So if I post on Facebook, it immediately goes to Instagram and vice versa. So that's good. I do it. Uh, Monster Palooza coming up uh, the uh, end of June. I mean, not the end of June, the beginning of June. So in a week and a half, we'll be at Monster Palooza in Pasadena. And then uh, 7th, 8th, and 9th, I'm going to be out there with Bob Elmore, who is the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, uh, Leatherface. And Robert Patrick, my buddy, we're going to be at Niagara Falls Comic Con up there in Niagara Falls on the Canadian side. And then I at the ending... Patrick. I love him to death. He's, he's so good. And then the ending of June, we're going to be at Crypticon, Kansas City. Uh, signing there so yes i mean right now it starts the big push for horror co sci-fi conventions until obviously at the end oh, of october so all right so brett thank you so much for coming on we'll see you soon and, and we'll see you on clown motel three yeah oh, i'll see you on the set I, well, will I will see you on the set buddy yeah we will i mean don't forget you. me i'm gonna get you a ghost and kill you i <laughs> don't you touch Hey, Ron, don't touch my ghost. No, I, under, I understand that I have all my men, and, we're, and the men are a lot of them, and uh, we have a secret on how to get rid of ghosts. Of course, I will not divulge that secret. You have to watch the movie to see. There you go. All right, so we'll see you soon. Thanks so much. Have a great weekend. Good luck at all the conventions, Take and care. thanks so much for coming you're, on the show. You've been a fine guest. Thank you. I appreciate you both. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yay, yay, yay. I like really like him a lot. He's yep. just a cool guy. And uh, so it's a lot of fun. So we're going to play a quick music video. Um, I, hopefully we don't get cut off for playing this video. But this is Jam Wayne, no problem. Uh, this guy is cool because he's like a, a country hip-hop artist. And he looks like he's all bearded, like he's a wild guy. But he actually works in, in, uh, in um, nuclear 
nuclear bombs or something. So uh, he's very interesting. So this is the name of the song, No Problem. The name of the artist is Jam Wayne. I'm trying to get him for a movie I'm doing. And then we'll be back with Daisy Jockling. <laughs> Okay, I ain't even gonna flex this Sunday. I ain't even up next, but one day you gon' put this tape in, hit the replay. Gon' vibe and you ride, chill to the music, feeling what I put in this side. Dealing with your vulnerable side, this go hard and I ain't even try. Close your eyes, just vibe with me. Do or die for life, really. When I ride and he drive, in me. Great spirit is my spirit. Navigate through the ways of the land, demonstrate when the nil understand. Give me grace when I don't understand which way is the best. No God's got a plan. Throughout my life, my Head stay dirty, down the ride when it's necessary. Walk the line, I got no worries. Take my time, I'm in no hurry. Brothers die, so my eyes blurry. Another ride to the cemetery. Live your life, you know death coming. Butter vape and we gone, homies. You don't really want no problem. You don't really want no problem. You don't really want no problem. You don't really want no you don't really want, you don't, you don't really want no problem All till I see that Till I drop down six feet deep in the casket Till my last breath and I breathe that Stand on the front line called in the action Keep my free, no relapse Try and stay clean but the mud gon' stick Suds in the fifth, duds on the whip One, two, five, six, so I'm curling the silk With a pearl on the hill, hand trick a flick a whole bit Peace with the wood on the grill Black in a bit, about to be curled when I slip out Put the hell cat on drill, smoke in the spill Get thrown, rap on the seat, you gon' see it with a pack on your still Been through hell and I'll be damned if I climbed out just so I can jump back in Back tie spin when I'm ass out Looking for the cash out Reds I'll go for the win Ride for my friend Most of them gone so long in the grave But they locked in a pen Smoke in the wind Raise up a toast to the ones that be locked down Doing a bit Know the world ain't shit Lord heard every prayer lift up down there Cell block six As the world on till Everybody Leroy left Had to put the south on drill About this here Yeah Bobbing with the head Now I'm mobbing in the streets I live Let me make this clear Wish the third Reds in the country Blue car tried and true and if it comes down to it and you cross that line in the red, white, and blue, boy, you better salute. You don't really want no problem. 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 Yay, Daisy! Hi, everybody. Now we want to welcome to our show with Ron Russell, classical rock viol violinist. Daisy Joplin, yay, we're so happy to see you. You look beautiful. Oh, my oh, gosh. Thank you. Yeah. You know, Ron, I will never forget what you said to me in our first interview. Which was? Daisy, I have not ever been wrong about my predictions about artists and you are going to have a career like kind of like Yanni, you know, and, and it was amazing. I, I, I said that. Yes. I will I not forget that. that. Good. Well, don't because it's a great compliment and you deserve it. You know, you earned that compliment. It wasn't a, a, a smoke up your ass compliment. It was a real one. I love your work. I love it. I mean, it's, Thank it's, you guys. It's I hope you're going to come to New York at some point. <laughs> yes, no. No, I'm sorry we never got to Egypt. You know, I'm still dying to go to Egypt. And you went to Egypt and you played in the pyramids. And I'm so like, I wish I was there. That would have been really a thrill, my dog. She's going again. She's going to do that again one day, yeah. though, right? Yeah, I'm thinking we're working out the right date so people, especially people from here, can have time to really lead up to that. But right now, we I was wondering about November this year, but to give people really time, I think we're looking at November 2025 for an amazing fun. concert. Um, I'm just going to turn my phone off. How did you do on that concert? Um, what was the press? Okay, so for – oh, did you say what was the press? Because we got amazing press. I, I mean – Amazing what press. They, what, they, what they say? 
so I mean, that's a good point. I should I should have it like memorized. But was, <laughs> you know, I don't even. I mean, I remember think I remember crying when I saw some of the reviews because they were so amazing. Um, um, I guess they talked about it as being this evening that I'm not going to be able to, cause I can't remember. I mean, it was a couple of years ago, um, that, you know, brought people together. We did have cultures. I mean, we had refugees performing with different cultures kind of around the Egyptian area. And then of course me and all these kind of Egyptian megastars. So I think it was just talking about the fact that these these musicians came together and produced something so uplifting you know it was everybody said it was a night never to forget and and apparently it was kind of interesting there are a lot of concerts i mean not like mega mega regularly it's still a big thing to have a concert at the pyramids but there happened but in this particular stage where there was actually a stage already because normally you know you would think there are already like erected stages around the pyramids right or one main one or something no there are seven something like seven if i remember rightly bits of gravel, right? Where you can put a stage and you pay thirty, forty thousand dollars whatever to get that bit of gravel. But no it's forty thousand dollars for a stage? Yeah, but you know, it is next to the pyramid. So anyway, and then you have to bring everything, your stage, your lights, your sound, your everything you want. The chairs, you know, actually I think some of them have chairs, but anyway, um <laughs> we, chairs. <laughs> we found a place where they already have a stage. We still had to bring the whole lighting rig and and you know, sound and everything. But this particular place was used a lot for events, but they'd never had a concert there. And when my producer was like um, saying, hey, we're not going to just have a concert. We're going to have an internationally renowned violinist. They were just, they never had something like this. And she said right until the last day, like there were moments when she thought they're just going to cancel or something. You know, they didn't really realize we're going to bring a mega amazing major concert with a violinist, <laughs> you know, to this stage. So it was pretty cool. And I met later people who were staying the night in hotels looking onto the pyramids and they could all hear the concert. So literally, oh. I after the concert, I went on a cruise with my fans who came to Egypt and then I came back and I stayed for a one or maybe two nights in one of these hotels Yay. that was over the pyramids. And the guys were like, we we know you. We watched your concert. It was unbelievable. And it was really amazing. Know. You know? Oh, you really so, want oh, to know. I, I'm not just the people who came, like everybody around could hear it. And they were like a violinist. They they were blown away. And I played some famous Egyptian songs that in their mind, they're like, we didn't even think a violinist could do this, let alone one who's British living in the US. Oh, wait a minute. Da hang on, Daisy. Where can I see this? You must have film. Yeah, is that something? So, Jimmy, I just saw you're going to play. Okay, so I got two of them, so we can nice. play. Is one, oh is, God, one, so nice. is, is one of those in Egypt? Yeah, so both of the ones, you know, I did, I think, last time, and if I didn't, we'll do it next time. <laughs> next interview, I'm already planning the next one. But um, we'd, of course, made a video of that concert. But what happened was a couple of months later, which is the videos you've got now. Um, so I had 16 fans who did fly all the way to Egypt to come to that concert, but so many weren't able to come. And basically they persuaded me to kind of recreate it here in New York. And that's what you're just about to watch. Oh, so okay. I hired like the best musicians from, it was actually three different states around here that I had to go to Pennsylvania, the whole of New York state, like the whole tri-state area, you know, Staten Island, people came from all over. Um, and I can't remember the last one, maybe New Jersey, because there are certain pockets where there's like quite a lot of music, Middle Eastern, you know, people, different nationalities, but there's not that many Middle Eastern really world-class musicians here. I, I guess just because there aren't that, that many Middle Eastern concerts that happen here. You know where you should have gone? To Astoria, Astoria, Queens, all mid-eastern uh, people. Did there are some there. There are some there. There's a ton in New Jersey and different places in Brooklyn. So we did get, we got the best of the best. I thought you were going to say LA because actually there's a lot, interestingly, like uh, if they come, well, this is from my small research that, you know, I was trying to find all these musicians, people like you should be in LA because there's tons of amazing Middle Eastern musicians there. Anyway, so that's what I thought you were going to say. Real but quick, Real quick, say hi to everybody in the chat room. because Yeah, who's there? <laughs> hey, and then, so if we were going to play, which one of these videos is do you like better? We have Global Fest Primordial or second video, Global Fest Fatma. 
Oh my God. Did you, do I have to choose then? Yeah. Choose one. Okay. So I'm going to choose Fatma. Fatma. Okay, and I haven't even heard the audio yet. Cause we just, this is like, I mean, finished this morning and the audio I haven't listened to. So hopefully it's going to be great. It's going to be great. Uh, so hopefully it's going to be good. And if it's not, well, I'll let you know one. <laughs> So okay, this so song, tell us what it is and then introduce yeah. it and we'll play it for everybody. So we're, this song was written by an Egyptian composer. He's an absolute idol in Egypt. Like not one Egyptian does not know and love Omar Khairat. It's spelled K-H-A-I-R-A-T. And this is one of his most famous pieces that we arranged and we played here um, in New York. So on this recording, you've got like musicians. I mean, it touches my heart because there is, for example, an incredible Palestinian musician <coughs> called Firas Traik, uh, if I've done said that rightly. And then also an Israeli musician, um, Michael Feigenbaum. There are musicians from Ukraine, from Russia, like you know, like music brings people together, all playing this stunning music together. So this particular- I'm excited, song, I wanna hear it, quiet. Yeah, this song's called what Fatima. What do you want? Oh, bring, it on. bring it on, bring it on. I've been waiting like three hours for this. <laughs> oh, hi. hi, take it away, Juan. Let's hear it.
They love it. So can you tell us real quick before Ron talks? They want to know who is the, who is the uh, what's the name of the, the guy who did the song, the music again? Omar, so O-M-A-R, and then okay. Hayrat is his last name, K-H-A-I-R-A-T. And he is a legendary Egyptian composer. And I actually, so I played this piece as well at the pyramids. And he, you know, we had to ask his permission. So he watched it. He wasn't able to come to the concert, but he watched, we did a live stream. He watched the live stream uh, the next day. And he wrote a text personally to me. Well, he asked his manager, sent it to me, um, where he said, Dear Daisy, I really enjoyed watching your performance of my music. You are a remarkable musician, and you are welcome in Egypt anytime. Uh, wow, that's awesome! Yeah, he's he's. It's like Billy Joel saying that. Or, I, I'm, you know, it's just he's such an icon in Egypt. Um, and I, I, his his music is so beautiful. It makes me you know. Like, okay. Right. okay, here we go. <laughs> first thing, first impression I got was I said, "Oh my God, this is so wonderful! It should be the background of a movie." Could that be a movie score? It boy, is. boy, could that be a fabulous and a wonderful movie? Then, of course, we got to you. <laughs> and I said to Jimmy, she's just an incredible violinist. I mean, nobody nobody bangs it like, I mean, do, 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 I could listen to you forever. I I'm really at, appreciate it. Ron, so I this. Mean, if I was your neighbor, I'd make a hole in the wall so I could hear you play. Okay, <laughs> I have to tell you, Daisy, 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 no bullshit. You really, I feel like when you play the violin and I look at you and I feel what you, you feel every note, you feel every little squeak. I see the passion and that's why the music is so beautiful. You are probably one of our greatest violinists uh, in the world. I've got to say it. I love your stuff. I truly do love your stuff. Swear my kid. Swear on my dogs. I, <laughs> I love. I, lo I could listen, and I love Midi some music because when I was young, my brother-in-law, who was Turkish, used to play an album called Port Said, and the music was Port Said da 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 Port Said da 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 da, and I used to dance to that. I love. Uh, I guess because I was once an Egyptian in past lives. I, I believe that I was an Egyptian. I believe it too. And I just love the whole culture. I love the deco. The, I do deco. Our house is all art deco. Uh, I, it, you, you are an experience. You are somebody. Uh, I don't he know didn't what, know you were coming on because he didn't see the promo. No. But our when, first guest was um, you know, he, someone who I'm a big fan of, you know, and so and then I and then I said when I announced it on the show that you were going to be the second guest, he, he lit all up and he's <laughs> on. Yeah. Thank no. you. So my daughter's here. She's a that was a Daisy. That's wow. Daisy. Wow. She she the Daisy is a is a violinist. She played in Egypt. And she the played at the pyramids in Egypt. I could hear it in the kitchen. It was fabulous. Isn't it fabulous? <laughs> you can so hear it in the kitchen. I go home in the kitchen. She said it's fabulous. <laughs> so I have to tell you a couple of things. You know, you, she wants to tell you something. I want to tell her something. Jimmy and I, <laughs> we're on our way to New York eventually, probably Good. June. How about lunch? Are we on for lunch? A thousand I have to percent. hug you. I have to hug you. <laughs> That's right. You just, you just do, you do it. I, it's we should tell everybody too, and we, we really have David, time. Can we can buy, play can, the other can video. Can people buy your music? Yes. Yeah. How do they buy your music? Go to iTunes. Yeah, actually, Jimmy's been releasing some new songs recently um, of mine. Well, they are live recordings. I'm actually recording a whole new album, which won't be released until January 2025, January 10th, 2025. But um, so what I'm releasing now are live recordings of concerts I've played over the last year, you know, a couple of years. One of them that we just released like two weeks ago, you guys, the single is called Indian Jesus Live. Yeah. And I don't know if it we have another before. song. What was the song we released before? Something in E minor? I forgot. Yeah, well, that was a really fun. It was on. 
birthday and it was an Irish jig. Yes, and so it's Morris and Stigany. So it's just like a traditional Irish tune. I love, I mean, I just love playing music from around the world. So, yeah. I but, have, I have uh, on uh, albums, but his music is great. I love his music. Yanni. About, yeah, Yanni, Yanni, okay. Yanni's music is great. But Yanni has all instruments, okay? Your music is better than his because it concentrates on the violin. And the violin is talking to me. Uh, I heard the violin speaking as you were playing. And I was creating a movie. It was like I was there with you. It's amazing what, what music does to people. It is it, so amazing. It does to the cobra. A cobra does from the flute. I, I have like, to tell you. Right now, yeah. right now I'm euphoric. <laughs> After the show, I want to go play your music. I'm going to play it. <laughs> I'm so it. happy. So a couple of things. First of all, that music, that song that we just listened to was written for a famous Egyptian movie called Fatima. So it's like named after. Okay. And um, this is kind of a really beautiful movie because it's about somebody who just, you know, was born into a very difficult, I think, uh, underserved, you know, poor family and overcomes all of these problems. So it's kind of very uplifting, beautiful movie. So I think the song's like that too. And then you mentioned about my neighbors because I actually live in an apartment building and uh, all my neighbors, like they open their doors when I practice so they can <laughs> literally, and, and their windows, like they complain when I go away. They're like, you were away on tour for three weeks. We missed you so much. I mean, my violin playing, they miss me as well. But like, so yeah, I got, it's, it is very cool. It's very cool. You know, years ago, about thirty, about thirty, about thirty years ago, we used to go. I forgot what building, but there was a building in New York where they served little coffee and pastries and concert, and it was usually violin and uh, you know string string music. I wish that was still happening because you certainly would play there i like i forgot what it was i shouldn't have even brought it up but so I, you I, guys I, have, I happen to love the violin very much if you guys want to hear if you guys want to hear daisy's going to have a show in july it's july 12th through 14th at yeah. the stern cornish estate at northgate it's a uh, hudson highland state park cold spring new york and you can go to daisy joplin foundation.org to find out about it. And then her website is daisyjopling.com and her Instagram is daisyjopling. And we're trying to build her social media. So please follow her, listen. And, and, and we have time if you want to play the other song for everybody, because that way it'll get a lot of exposure. Definitely. Uh, we are tentatively, if we don't have more bullshit happening here, you know, we, we work all the time, coming into New York in June. So wouldn't it be Good. nice if we timed it when you're playing somewhere in Are July, she's playing in July. Are you playing in July? Mm, okay. We'll see. So tell us about this first one, Global Fest Primordial, and we'll play it real quick. Okay, so basically um, the reason why it says Global Fest, just to put some good vibes out there, uh, Global Fest is an amazing concert that happens, well, every year in 2025. It's going to be January 12th at Lincoln Center, I believe, because they have 10 groups that they call world music. I mean, you know, world music is kind of a crazy word in a way because we're all part of the world. So all our music is in a way world music. But what, what we in the States and I guess the Western world call world music is anything that's coming from a very different musical culture than ours. So for example, Indian music, for example, Middle Eastern music, maybe anything Latin American, African, all of these are considered world music. So they've maybe speaking in a different language, you know. Anyway, so I'm applying and you have to apply to be like part of this concert. So I'm applying using these videos um, to be able to play at Lincoln Center January 12th, 2025. So let's put some good vibes out there for that. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think that they should beg you. <laughs> well, let's see. Hopefully they're going to love it. That's why they all say Global Fest on them. Um, you have played at Lincoln Center before, though, right? You played at Awakening. You're Awakening. Yes, which was amazing. How come I never heard of you? 
years ago I'm talking about because when I lived in New York. Now, when you lived in New York, she was like, it's still a baby. I, I don't think you were born. <laughs> Maybe you weren't, you weren't born yet. No, that's probably why. You were learning to play the violin. No, but when I lived in New York, I went to everything. Wow. Uh, did you? Uh, really? I miss it. You know, living in Palm Springs, I became a vegetable. Because when I lived in New York, I went to theater, osc- opera, concerts. I filled my head with so much wonderful stuff. I remember listening to opera when, um, what the hell was her name? Bubbles. You know who Bubbles was? One Not of the greatest Bubbles. opera singers of our day. I was going to say Michael Jackson. And her nickname, is, her nickname <laughs> was Bubbles. Bubbles. <laughs> Bubbles. Bubbles. Uh, anyway, we're going to play the song. So wait, I was paying her a compliment. I have heard some of the greatest performers back then. And now I have you as one of the greatest performers. It's great. So I, I so, love your stuff. So I'm, introduce and it I'm not for being us. Phony. And everybody out there, don't say, oh, Ron's being so sweet. No, he's not. He doesn't say that about but, hardly anybody. <laughs> no, no, there's a lot of, honey, there's a lot of bullshit out there that I can't stand. This rap crap, all that horrible junk. Ugh. You know, talent. Listen, you know how long it takes to play a violin like that? Do you know how many hours? How many hours? <laughs> I don't, but she does. No, you know. I know, <laughs> I know. Because I know other people that play a violin, and they sometimes just don't get it. No matter how hard they work at it, the brain and the hand, the fingers just don't coordinate. She is so coordinated. Her lips move like this. <laughs> Okay. And I see her fingers hitting the notes. Her lips are telling the fingers what note to play. I never noticed that. Yeah, I know. I notice everything. Watch your video. Watch your mouth. I your mouth. Not- no. When you hit a high, your mouth opens. When you go to a low, your mouth goes low. You 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 actually are singing. With that violin. Yes, I am. So, silently. So, silently. So introduce the video. Let's play it quick. We have like 11 minutes and the video is like five and then we'll come back and talk about yeah. it. Okay, so okay. I mentioned to you that I hired these world-class Middle Eastern musicians yes. from around this whole area. So kind of New York State and, and nearby. And the, the, the this video is a piece that I wrote it's called Primordial, but it's like arranged with all these amazing Middle Eastern musicians playing their percussion and everything in there. And there's two really typical uh, Middle Eastern instruments that we have kind of versions of, but a bit different. One is like that sitting down. It's like a zither in a way. It's called a kanun, Q-A-N-U-N. And it's going to open with this guy, Faraz Traik, who's from Palestine, who's is like one of the best, I mean, in the world. He's amazing at this canon. He plays a solo, which is improvised, uh, and then it goes into primordial, and then there's also this amazing um, tambu- um, bamboo flute, which is just like, instead of playing it like this, you play it like straight, you know, down ahead of you, uh, and that is played by Gideon Forbes. There's going to be a solo from him as well. So primordial, let's take it away. Yay. Okay, let's go. <laughs>
<laughs> Yay! Now, you wrote that. I did. How the hell do you write everybody's piece? How do you do that? I often wonder. Each musician, you write what that musician has to do. Yeah, the way, the way I do it, though, is I work with an arranger, like a musical arranger, and I'll write the main, like, the form of the piece, like, all the different, in that case, there were quite a lot of different melodies going on at the same time, you know, like, kind of I'll write down most of the stuff, uh, and I'll make maybe an audio recording, and then I'll send it to the arranger, and I'll tell him, this is what I want, I want this, I want the flute to play this, or the ney, in that case, it was an Egyptian flute, uh, I want this, I want, you know, I tell him everything thing and he does it and he sends it back to me and I'm like I love it or actually I need to change this and you know we work together so there are some composers but I'm not one of them who writes as you said every single note for every instrument but I pretty much direct the arranger to do that but I don't actually do it. Now what made you think that you could put a violin to this sort of music? You know it's not done. It's so interesting that you said that you feel that my voice, I guess you said my voice is like influencing my violin playing or creating the sound of my violin. And I wanted the violin to sound like a voice, you know, so some of those lines, I mean, some of the lines are totally violinistic kind of melodic lines, but some of them are like little phrases as if you're saying something. Um, so I just, I do feel like my violin is my voice or, or is like a kind of voice. Um, so I just really wanted that to be translated in that way. And literally um, the whole idea of this piece, when I wrote it, I wanted something that felt, you know, all of this is so metaphorical, but felt like the middle of the planet earth like the middle of the planet right where it's kind of like flames and it's crazy and um i just wanted that something that sounded fiery but also sounded um as if there could be a place where nothing comes from you can't describe that place but every single thing that we create every thought we have and every word we say and every action we take comes from this place of unmanifested. So this is me in a kind of metaphorical way trying to describe that, you know. And this was this idea that it's drums with the strings, you know, it's like that. It's like the the rhythmic beat, but then also this flowingness, you know, the kind of lava, the kind of everything. Anyway, that's 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 that was the idea originally. Well, before before there was television, there was a time when there was no television. Uh, my family, we would have concert, you know, the radio, and the family would sit there, and my father would teach us. He'd say, now, you hear the ocean? You hear the waves? You hear? Now, listen, there's a bird. The storm is over. Now, can you feel the sun? He actually taught us to listen to music, because concert music, it speaks to you. And I find that uh, I'm so happy that I, I was taught that. Because I, I don't listen to music. I become music. What a beautiful way of saying it. That is what happens to us. You know, I'm allowing the music to flow through me and kind of, um, I want to use the word elevate, but like tap into the place which is in all of our minds, which is kind of like in the present moment. You know, it definitely feels like a letting go you know, what I really feel like when I play, I can feel my muscles relaxing. You know, the music you are, is actually... You, you are totally... You are, you are no longer human. You become, right. you become music. If, if kind of makes, like a whistle, yeah. If that makes any sense. You, you know, when I listen to your music, I become your music. I have to shake. I have to get in it. Da -da 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 -da. So, hang on. So real quick, because we're out of time. So in the oh. chat room, they're saying that you should... Uh, Bring it to the Nobel Peace Committee, you know, and see if they use that piece, you know, to support world peace. And um, you guys, Daisy's got a show. Again, it's on July 12th through 14th. Go to daisyjoplingfoundation.org. Check out our new single, Indian Jesus Live. She's going to have a lot of new music coming out. And we'll have her back on at the end of the are you, summer. Are you coming to L.A.? Is that in the future? I mean, I hope so. I mean, not I hope so. I'm sure I will at some point. I have nothing planned, but yeah. You, should, sure. you should play the Hollywood Bowl. I would love to. <laughs> Daisy, thank you for coming on. Good luck thank with everything. Thank you so we'll much. I love you guys.
You are so delightful in personality, so talented in music, and whoever is your lover is so lucky. <laughs> because, because that person's got it all. We gotta go. We gotta go. All thank right. You. Bye, Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thanks for Bye, joining us. So everyone who joined us. Bye. Bye. See you guys next week. Bye. Can try not to be so wrong. Yeah, we in the mix. Yeah, we in the mix. It's another episode. Here we go. The Jimmy Star Show with Ron Russell. Interviewing the hottest, newest, and truest of today's celebrities. Make sure to subscribe so you can get notified weekly. Jimmy Star, he's the king of cool. Ron Russell, he's a gorgeous dude. Chat room is live and you would be a fool not to vibe with us at the Jimmy Star Show with Ron Russell. So come watch it live on W4CY Radio. Miss some past episodes? Download on iTunes. The Jimmy Star Show with Ron Russell. It's the Jimmy Star Show with Ron Russell. Oh.